Stonewalker Outdoors. Uh, back with an installment, uh, one of several installments for Shadows in the Forest this year. Um, again, uh, we were asked to teach at the School of the Long Hunter, which was back in April. It was the third time that I was actually asked to teach there, so it made me feel kind of good that, uh, again, I'm doing something uh, at least worthwhile and in the eyes of the reenactment world worthy enough to actually teach and uh, I got to teach with um, Nate Kobuck and we taught how to make market wallets. Now there was a whole host of other people there that were teaching and um, maybe some names that you didn't know but what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to break this uh, series down into some shorter um, videos. This way you're going to be able to get the, the experience of it um, one at a time, and you get to see some of the effort that people put into their presentations. But again, we are the one that stands the test of time, and everybody keeps coming back, even with the impending weather. That's just normal. I had somebody ask me, well, that's, that's going to be horrible weather. I said, no, it's not as long, Hunter. If you're not a long hunter and it doesn't get a suntan, rain, and have snow by the time you leave, it's not a real long hunter. Yeah, that's all right. And all I can say is, you folks are the ones that are here, and it's awesome. Okay, it's not for the faint of heart, obviously, and uh, we do our best to make a good go of it, no matter what the weather. Exciting news! What's next year? The 25th anniversary. Time to do some big things. And we're going to have some interesting things down the line. <clears throat> we're looking at the exact same weekend as this year. So you can pretty much put it on your calendars that first weekend in April. <clears throat> and one of the things we decided to do, and we've kind of prepped you the last couple years talking about it, showing you some teasers. We're going to hold a huge uh, fundraising event to help the fort out in uh, honor of our 25th anniversary. And we have what's called the Grand Raffle. All right, so again, welcome to the 24th uh, year of School Long Hunter. Um, I think we have a good mix of topics and uh, threw in uh, two different uh, hands-on opportunities for you, one today and one tomorrow, uh, that you can actually make and take something home. <clears throat> um, today's will be the market wallet uh, with uh, Brian and Nathan, if he shows up. <laughs> Is that bad? I'm already talking about it. No. No, Nathan will be here. Um, He's gotten much better with his because he's on choo-choo time. <laughs> and then he works with the railroad. Uh, so <clears throat> always we try to go with people's interests and try to find out what kind of topics you want to hear, which is another thing for next year. Again, make sure you're thinking about something you'd like to do, somebody special we might be able to try and get, uh, especially since it's the 25th, if there's somebody repeat to bring back. Okay? Um, so our first uh, presenter is a longtime participant of Long Hunter, and he uh, one of the faithful followers. And funny conversations always pop up at different times. And one of the topics that's always come up is the whole being able to, you know, when you're out in the woods, what are things that I can use for different purposes? And uh, I think. Uh, 
Joe goes, you know, it'd be cool to have a talk on being able to, when you're out in the woods and you need something about medicinal uses of plants and uses of plants and so forth. I said, yeah, that would be. And he goes, you know, I can do that. Uh, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> I'm making it sound good. Oh, okay. <laughs> and you know, it's funny. One of the things uh, that makes uh, Long Hunter so enjoyable is being able to talk to people. And yeah, we, everybody has a shared common interest. But it's also kind of interesting to hear some of the other stories from the outside world of what they do when they're outside of our little. Uh, kingdom here. And uh, you gotta help me out. So Forester. Huh? Forester. Forester. Nice. Uh, for the Penn the, State. The Penn State. Eight thousand acres. Yep. And he's also so that also makes him oh, a oh, 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 <laughs> and I got one more. And he's also please a professor. No, no, no. I'm a forester that ended up teaching. You're still a professor, come on. When you're in the classroom, it's a professor. Anyhow, I, I, um, Joe's a good guy, lots of knowledge. He spent tons of time, literally, uh, in the woods. Uh, so without further ado, Joe Harding, and he's going to share some of his uh, findings and knowledge about plants and plants and medicinal uses out in the woods. Thank you, Joe. introduction, Bill, you're, you're something else. <laughs> and Greg, thanks for the opportunity to speak. So good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm excited to be here and share this topic with you. It is a funny way how this came about. We did talk about it, and I said, wouldn't it be great to have somebody give a talk about it? And uh, then Bill said, well, that could be you. So I want to start out by saying I am not an expert. I'm sure there's a lot of folks out here that have a lot more knowledge than I do. But what I came up with is some pretty interesting information that will work for you. And so when it's all said and done and on the handout that you have, there's some takeaways of some plants and, and materials that you can find in the woods that will work for those situations noted. So, talk. Uh, if, uh, can you turn it down a little bit more? I think uh, so we can see it's right behind you there at the coffee. Good, thank you. So, the evolution of medicine and the use of medicinal plants in colonial America. I started out wanting to just come in here with some samples of live plants so that I could show you how to do it and use it. And, but I thought this is such a discerning crowd, there's no way that I could just come up and say, use this plant for this, that you all would want to know references on where you heard that, where that came from. And so this whole talk evolved from just coming up with some live plants and showing people wow, this is cool, you can do this with it, to this whole backstory of how we got from where we were when we first settled the Americas to where we are now. And so I hope you enjoy it. Uh, the way I give presentations, I, I am a, a teacher, I'm a forester that ended up doing forestry for 30 years and they wanted me to teach. And so I'm a very interactive te teacher, so if you have a question during the talk, feel free to, to, to raise your hand and, and ask it or have a comment. So. Let's get started. So, general state of medicine in colonial America. Well, really, we were just a new colony, and so what we had is what they had in Europe. And so whatever the latest and greatest medicinal practices in Europe is what they brought over to the United States, no, not to the Americas. Um, problem was is that the medical arts hadn't really changed since the medieval ages. They were still kind of practicing what they knew back then all the way up into the 1600s. And so, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but there was this theory of the four humors and their fluids in your body is what they thought. And so, there's blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. And so, if you had some imbalance in these humors, that's what made you ill. And so, their whole idea was if you're going to become healthy, we have to somehow restore that balance of the humors in your body. So, they came up with this uh, general term for the medicine they used back then. It's called heroic medicine. And the way they achieved balance in your body was by one depletion, which was bloodletting 
we're using leeches. And I'm sure you all have heard stories about how that's worked out for different people in the history. Uh, it's a pretty, uh, pretty uh, aggressive act. The second one was blistering, is where they would actually take glass cups and they would heat them up and they would put them on your skin and they would kind of cause suction and cause big blisters and then those blisters would seep clear fluid and they thought, oh great, we're getting something out of the body, we're achieving balance. And then the last one was elimination and that was the use of purgatives, laxatives, emetics to produce diarrhea or vomit. Doesn't that sound exciting? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, that whole idea of, of, of purging and, and working out works well with medicinal plants, and we'll get into that in a second. So just to kind of sum up, oh, that slide was so washed out, that's too bad. The background slide is a, a microscopic view of the smallpox virus, and I thought that was interesting that they didn't know that bacteria and viruses cause disease. What they did know is that we had to get something out of the body to get balanced. And so that whole theory worked really well with plants because it is not hard to find a plant that's going to make you sweat, urinate more, throw up, diarrhea. There's a lot of plants out there if used the wrong way, or in their opinion at that time the right way, can have those reactions on your body. So. Back in uh, Europe at this time, they uh, had different levels of medical pr practitioners. And the first one was the physicians. If I try to move this right now, will I screw everything up? Or will it go? Oh, there we go. All right. So, current level of medical practitioners is the first one is the physicians, and they had an academic degree. They cured patients with drugs or diet. They did not perform any surgeries, and they didn't make or sell drugs. They didn't want to be at that level. So the next level was the surgeons, and imagine this. Sometimes they had an academic degree. So you have somebody that's doing surgery on you, and they may or may not have training in that. They performed the surgeries, and they were actually lower status than the physicians. And then we had the barbers. Wow, this is a very sensitive clicker. The barbers were trained as apprentices to the, either the physician or the surgeon, and they did simple surgeries. You'd go to the barber to get your tooth pulled, you'd go to the barber to get some bloodletting, you know, just simple things like that. And then the last was the midwives, because there was still at that time somewhat of a taboo that men didn't work on women, and so there were midwives, and they just kind of passed down their knowledge from general practice from midwife to midwife to midwife. All right, so what did the levels of practitioners look like in America? Well, initially, when people were coming over to the Americas, their physicians thought, hey, this would be great. This is a great opportunity, new world, get more notoriety, become famous, make a lot of money. And so who do you think was the first person in the Americas that had any kind of medical training or was a physician? Any ideas? Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin? Go back. Columbus. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> we just said go back. Well, I do. You know, it wasn't the Vikings either. But no, it was Samuel Fuller and Miles Standish from the Pilgrims. Miles, uh, Samuel Fuller was a physician and Miles Standish had medical training, which I never knew. I thought that was pretty amazing that all the way back then, we had physicians coming over, but what happened is because of, of conditions and, and the way the settlements worked that this whole idea of becoming famous and wealthy didn't really work out. So the trained physician said, oh, let's just stay in York for a while and then we're just going to have to work with what we have. And so because we didn't have enough physicians and we needed a lot of medical attention, all those levels from over in Europe, the physician, the surgeon, the barber, and the midwife kind of got melted together and that one person did everything. And, and sometimes they, uh, they, after the first series of people that might have been trained, the next series of people were trained by apprenticeship. But oftentimes that wasn't enough to pay the bills and so they sometimes had to do something else. So, there were a lot of traveling clergymen physicians. So, 
All right, so kind of sum up where we're at. Increasing need for medical treatment. This is amazing. By the end of the 17th century, the death rate in Philadelphia was greater than the birth rate. And the only way the population was growing is by more immigration. So if you just think about that, there was a tremendous need for medical care because that's just a sample, but a lot of people were dying. And it was because of uh, the, uh, all the high infant mortality rates. They didn't know how diseases were spread, what caused them. Uh, smallpox, typhoid, all these different diseases were rampant back in the time. So the average age was about 35 back in the 1700s. So we're probably all gone. Think about that. Uh, back in the 1700s, there was estimated there was a total of 200 medically trained physicians in the entire colonies. 200 for the whole population. So obviously not enough people to take care of everybody. So they were either weren't available or they were, uh, the, the drugs that were available were too expensive for the common person. Let's see if I can make this thing just go with one way. All right. So, since there weren't enough doctors, since the drugs weren't terribly available or terribly or too expensive, what happened is that some people started to publish medical handbooks. And I don't know if you've ever seen this one. It, uh, it's an amazing read. It's called uh, Every Man His Own Doctor. And it was published by uh, John Tennant. He's from Scotland. And it was published first in Williamsburg, and then they reprinted it across the states. If you read the recipes in here for the different treatments, it's amazing more people didn't die. Well, in fact, more people did die because some of these. But they, they put these out so that the common man would have some way of learning how to take care of themselves. And I think this quote here is pretty interesting. Plain and easy means for persons to cure themselves of all or most of the distempers incident to this climate and with very little charge, the medicines being chiefly of the growth and production of this country. So the medicines were from this country. The next quote is kind of funny as well. He publishes this treatise to lead the poorer sort into the pleasant paths of health when they have the misfortune to be sick to show them the cheapest and easiest ways of getting well again. So these sort of publications came about. There were a couple other ones. William Buchanan had one. And then John Wesley had one. So they were trying to address the need for medical care. But that also led to the snake, not the snake doctors, the quacks that were peddling the snake oil. So we had a legitimate need. They were trying to address it. There were some people that were trying to make profit off of others' misfortune. And we also had this problem, like I said, that some of these cures in here, you know, they gave people mercury. They gave them lead. They, you know, amazing things nowadays that we know are crazy, but. This is an interesting quote that I found from the journal of Nicholas Creswell. Uh, he was sick. He was traveling south. He got laid up. Uh, Captain Knox sent for the doctor. The doctor came in and the doctor looked at the pills that he'd been describing and kind of got this white look on his face like, oh, I screwed up. And Nicholas Creswell got so mad that he punched him in the face. And he said, I would have uh, given him a good trimming had I been able. And he's leaving myself poisoned and grew desperate and abused him most unmercifully. So I don't know if anybody has experienced an unpleasant experience with the doctor, but that was a common occurrence back in the 1700s that, you know, they tried. Uh, maybe they were quacks, maybe they were really trained, but because of what they were using, it really wasn't necessarily the best treatment, and it made it hurt them more than it helped them. Everybody knows what that is. It's a very common tree. And the, the thought here was I wanted to give plants and trees because plants are only available during the growing season. And so if you're out in the woods when the growing season is over and you have an issue, what's another cure that you could identify and use to address an issue you might have in the woods? Black walnut is an amazing tree. It's uh, extremely valuable for timber, but it's very high in tannins and iodine. And so you can use an infusion of the leaves or the hulls or the decoction of the inner bark, and it's an astringent. It's, it'll, it'll kind of suck things together, suck the moisture out, it's antiseptic and it's antibacterial. It's an amazing, amazing plant for all the different uses. Anti-parasitic too. Parasitic, oh yeah, so if you have ringworms, which I don't know anybody's ever had ringworms, but I imagine if you have ringworms, it will, it will cure that as well. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, if you are out in the bush and you get a tremendous fever or you have a lot of pain, again, yarrow is a tremendous herb for that. You can make a tea. What it does is induce a lot of sweating and helps kind of cool you through the evaporation and break the fever. You can use it for toothache and it'll help you sleep if you're having issues with sleeping from the pain. These are some another amazing trees. Willow, typically willow grows near wet areas. It could be a small shrub or a large tree, weeping willows. There's aspen, which uh, has the, the leaves that turn the bright yellow in the fall. And then there's dogwood. It has the beautiful white flowers that turn to red berries. And it has kind of the alligator type bark. A decoction of any one of these barks, from the willow, the aspen, or dogwood, is a very, uh, will, oh wow, I'm sorry, is uh, very uh, effective in feeding, uh, treating fever or pain. Mm -hmm. So willow and the aspen actually have strong concentrations of salicylic acid, is what aspirin is now. The, the manufactured aspirin. So they have strong concentrations of that. So when you make a tea or infusion, you bring that out. What type of willow is that? Do you know? So that's a black willow. Black willow. And so there's black willow, white willow, weeping willow. All willows have it. Black willow is supposed to be the best. Okay. If you're out in the field and you had the unpleasant experience of dysentery or diarrhea, say if you uh, drank water from a stream and you got giardia. Uh, a staghorn sumac cold infusion. So you take the berries, put them in cold water, steep them for a long time. It's actually a pretty interesting drink. It's kind of a lemonade-y, very tart. I mean, it's very tart, uh, but it has tremendous properties for helping with diarrhea. Plantain will do the same thing. An infusion of plantain, blackberry. Take the leaf, take the root, pound it up, make a tea, It'll help very, very well with dysentery or diarrhea. White oak bark, dogwood, black walnut, slippery elm. Again, any of the inner barks, the decoction of those will also help with dysentery. A couple more. Broken bone sprain. You, you know, you twist your ankle, you're out hiking. If you know what comfrey is, if you can find comfrey, it's a, a pretty large plant, it has a lot of foliage, long oval lanceolate leaves with kind of whitish purple flowers. You can make a poultice of that. And this chemical compound in the leaves, the allantoin, toin, is, is chemically proven to help regenerate cells and knit things together. Sassafras, now here's another one. Sassafras was one of those big exports from the New World to Europe. They, they, they loved it. Sassafras has been proven to have cancer-causing properties in high dosage. So, you drink a cup of sassafras tea, it's doubtful that you're going to get cancer. And it's supposed to help well with upset stomachs, but it also helps when you make a wash or you make a fomentation and you put it on a bruise, it'll help disperse that. It'll make and help sweat. that to, to heal. What's that, Brian? It'll make you sweat, too. Makes you sweat with the, with the internal use. Yes. Yeah. Upset stomach. You ate some of somebody's bad cooking or bad food. Peppermint tea. Yeah. Dandelion tea. Yeah. Slippery elm bark. Slippery elm is like the do-all, cure-all. And so, uh, well, I'll talk about that in a second. Powdered inner bark of that will take care of all sorts of things. And then sassafras tea will also help with an upset stomach. Question? Dandelion tea, are we talking about flour? Anything. Any part of it, yeah. And that was another imported plant, believe it or not. Yeah. Okay, so I have a long list of references. If you didn't get a handout, they have extra copies they can make for you in the office. It has a reference list for all the materials that I referenced in here. I didn't have a reference list printed off of all the photo citations. I found that people that take photos for a living are very serious about you using their photo without citing it. So every photo that's not in the public domain has been cited here. So uh, I have some of the, the books that are used to identify plants. I have the Materia Medica. I have some bark here. And 
if the weather is cooperative and there's time either this afternoon or tomorrow afternoon and anybody would like to go for a walk, not only can I show you some of these plants wherever they may be, there's also a whole host of other plants. Being a forester, there's, there's other plants that do wonderful things, yellow birch bark for tinder and basswood for making rope and all sorts of plants out there that if you know what they are, you could do amazing things in the woods. So I'd be willing to do that. Question? <laughs> Okay, and they have some of these plants listed. Yeah. Okay, yes. great. Another question? Uh, yeah, I was wondering on that part that said that the life expectancy was around 35 years. Yes, sir. From colonists. Yes. What is there any information as to the, the native people's life expectancy range? Uh, you know, I didn't I didn't come across it in my research for this presentation, so I couldn't tell you. Does anybody have any ideas on Native American life expectancy? Certainly, was good as once the uh, the English and the colonists the came and introduced the diseases. The Native American came in contact with the European settler. They usually caught a disease. Yeah. Yeah. That really life expectancy. Yeah. Another question back there, Mike. Joe, is mowing and land here the same thing? Mm, no. 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 Common mullein starts out as like a low to the ground rosette of First these year. gray silky flowers, and then it shoots up that stalk, and it'll get really tall, so biannual. It's second biannual, yeah, two years. What's that? I said that's the second year. Second year, it shoots the stock up. Yeah. Other questions? You showed common plantain. Was uh, buckhorn given the same result? Buckhorn plantain? Uh, so there's there's the round leaf and the narrow leaf. Right. Actually, the narrow leaf is supposed to have higher concentrations okay. of some of the chemical compounds, but it's not as common. So one of the ways to identify plantain is that the, the leaf might be about this large and the veins, there's one main vein, but all the other veins run basically parallel to the main vein. And they're really hard veins, you can see them easily. But there's another version that has a very long linear leaf that has the same sort of veination, but it's not as common. Yeah. Yeah, that's edible too. Though. Yeah, yeah, you can use it in a salad, get it while it's young. Other questions? Another use for that mullet, you can take the leaves and dry it and smoke, smoke it. it. And yeah. it's good for, for long elements. Yeah. yeah. So uh, while I was doing this, I, I could always heard the term used before. Connect, 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 connect. That, uh, the, I think the, uh, the, the translation of that word was, uh, uh, I lost it, broken in pieces or something like that, or mixture. And so there were a lot of things that were broken up and used and smoked in Kniknik, so that's a real term. Uh, one plant that I didn't mention is colt's foot. Colt's foot is one of the first yellow flowers of the spring. It will grow on the roadside. Uh, it makes a tremendous cough syrup or tea for coughs and colds, but the leaves and the flowers can be dried and smoked. And I have, and they're, they're not that bad. Other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you learned something. I'll be here all weekend if you have questions or want to go for a walk.